seated. We will now ask our sister deacon Monica Dempster to bring us the welcome and announcements. Welcome to this third Sunday in Lent at the Mandeville Circuit of Baptist Churches. The circuit consists of the New Green Baptist Church, the Greenvale Baptist Church, and the Mandeville Baptist Church here in the heart of Mandeville, Manchester. We especially welcome all worshipers who have joined us live on our YouTube channel and invite you, if you do not have a permanent church home, to please prayerfully consider joining one of our congregations here in the Mandeville Circuit of Baptist Churches. If you're here for the very first time in the sanctuary, may we invite you to stand so we can acknowledge you. Any first timers? Okay, welcome again, everyone. This morning, I'm very pleased to extend congratulations to our pastor, Reverend Pinnock, at our recent General Assembly, our pastor was elected as one of, from the floor, as one of the members of the National Executive of the Baptist Union. Let us applaud him. And I know Rev would want me to say that he will need all our prayers and all our support as he represents on this very important body. Do we agree, church? Yes. Amen, amen. Sisters and brothers, friends all, please take note of the following. Our Bible study will be held weekly on Tuesday at 6.30 p.m. during the Lenten season. So the Lenten season runs from February 21 to March 20th. It's under the theme Crucified with Christ. The services will begin at 6.30 p.m. each Wednesday. And this Wednesday, our church, the Mandeville Baptist Church, will host the meeting, the service. We are all members, all of us are invited to participate on Wednesday evening beginning at 6.30 p.m. We have been asked to join the new green, sorry, the Greenvale Baptist Church in Bible study during this Lenten service, Lenten period or season. You are invited to join in the sanctuary where you can or online. Please note that the Family Bible Hours encourage all members and visitors to join a class for fellowship and Bible study. On Sunday mornings, we begin at 8.45 a.m. And the following families are to be for our focus prayers this week. The Jones family, Sister Beryl Josephs and family, Sister Latoya Kelly and family, and Sister Yvonne King and family. The New Green Baptist Church will host their Sunday school anniversary this afternoon at 4.30 p.m. And the Trinity Baptist Church also invites us to their family Bible hour anniversary service at 3.30 p.m. this evening as well. The Greenvale Baptist Church Sunday School anniversary will be held March 10th. And uh, remind us that our Sunday School anniversary will be held here at church on the 17th of March. And all auxiliaries and community committee chairs are being invited to mobilize support for members for both services. Please note and be reminded that our next circuit leadership training will be held on Saturday, March 23rd at 9 a.m. And all leaders and aspiring leaders are invited to attend. We remind you that our regular second Saturday pray and fasting service will be held this Saturday um, beginning at 9 a.m. Right. We are all invited to attend. And before I go any further, Sister Sarah is here. Good morning, Sister Sarah. <laughs> we are so happy to see Sister Sarah had to break, just as if, you know, 
the, those senior moments when you have something in mind but it goes away. Well, Sister Sarah, we're so, so, so very happy to have you in service this morning. Family, you know that Sister Sarah has not been feeling very well, but God is good and she's here this morning and she's looking great. So back to the notices. God is good. Back to the notices. All Family Bible Hour teachers, you're invited to a meeting, brief meeting with Sister Frances this morning, right after the end of the worship service. And the funeral service for our late brother Albert Clark will be held at the Mandeville Seventh-day Adventist Church, 15A Caledonia Road at 11 a.m. That's on March 11th at 11 a.m. at the Mandeville Seventh-day Adventist Church. The Greenvale Baptist Church Women's Federation will host their mental health discussion on Sunday, March 24th. We are invited to join them in this discussion. And Sembio Retreat. Sembio Retreat will be held on Friday. It will be held Friday to Sunday, April 12th to the 14th. It's going to be held at the Deaf, Deaf Village, and the cost is $6,000 per person, and you may register with your Sembio representative. The Faith Family Fellowship International Ministry invites participation in their music, gospel music challenge. This is going to take place or begin on April 21. It will last for six weeks. There are 16 teams, and they are inviting a team of persons to join them and to participate. For further information, please contact the church office. The Mandeville Baptist Church extends best wishes to all members and visitors who are celebrating birthday, wedding, and spiritual anniversary this week. We rejoice with you. And at this point, we want to invite all those born in March to skip around. Stand up, please, so we can sing for you. Those born in the month of March, we want to sing God's blessings for you. And Russell is celebrating birthday today. Come up front here, Russell. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear friends. Happy birthday to you. May the dear Lord bless you. May the dear Lord bless you. May the dear Holmes, please, Sister Pinock, please give Russell a big hug for all of us. Happy birthday, Russell. We love you and we wish pray God's blessings upon you. My sisters and brothers, may this third Sunday in Lent teach us about the integrity of self-judgment. Sister Coombs has something to add and I now invite her. God bless you as we continue to worship. Good morning, everyone. Oh, let us see what the Lord has done. You look so lovely. Let us just give a praise to the Lord. Amen. Wow, I can see the joy of the Lord, Mark, all over you. And I'd like to come up here, you know. You know why? Because guess what? When I ask you for help, you are so ready to help. So guess what now? You know the dancers for Christ have been dancing, and you can see what God has done in their lives. They brought the gold medal here to this church. And so, Sister Kelleen is asking for help. No, I'm not saying, even if you have two left foot, we don't work as ordinary people. We work as extraordinary people when the Lord, once we give ourselves to the Lord to be used, he can use us. Let me, and so I'm asking for an assistant for Sister Kelleen because you know, as a young wife, as a, as, a, as a teacher, as a this, 
you know, she needs the help. So I know today, by faith, in the name of Jesus Christ, we are getting somebody to help with the dancers for Christ. Because guess what? I have to move with the puppet ministry, and I have the names of seven boys who wants to start something. Let us give the young men a clap because they're coming at Sunday school anniversary and when you see them, you better make sure to come out on that day because we have a new group being formed. So church, you know that we love you and we thank you. Brother Rob has needs the support for the Sunday school anniversary. So please be there. Thank you. We're going to ask the, the sanctuary choir to bring the intro at this point. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross, lift high his royal banner, it must not suffer loss. From victory unto victory, his army he shall lead, till every foe is vanquished and Christ is Lord indeed. Let us stand and sing to the glory of God.
for the responsive sentences. Almighty God, you who, fas who have fashioned creation, forged our nation and formed our denomination, ye stand in awe of your otherness and bow in reverence to your holiness. You are worthy and you are wonderful, and we worship you with all our hearts. Merciful God, you who have made provision for our forgiveness and cleansing, we humbly confess that we are sinners and cast ourselves totally upon your grace. You are gracious and you are generous, and we worship you with all our hearts. Missional God, you who have called us to service in the ministry of the church, we completely give ourselves to you as a living sacrifice that you may do with us as you will. You are present and you are powerful, and we worship you with all our hearts. Triune God, we adore you today with our praise and our worship. You are indeed worthy. We will worship you with all our being. Praise him, praise him, Jesus, our blessed Redeemer. Let us now offer to our God our prayers of adoration, confession, and thanksgiving to our amazing God following the hymn of praise. Praise him, praise him. Jesus, our blessed Redeemer.
praise the Lord. Let's praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise him. Praise him. Jesus, our blessed Redeemer. You may be seated as we go to God in prayer. Let us pray. O oh Lord, my God, thou, oh Lord God, art very great. Thou art clothed with honor and majesty, who coverest thyself with light as with a garment, who stretched out the heavens like a curtain. We honor, we glorify, and we lift up your holy name. Almighty God, our merciful, loving Father, we reverence and adore your holy name this morning, Almighty God. You are the God to whom we give all the honor, all the glory, and all the praise. We love you, Lord God, because you created us in your image and in your likeness. And you have given us the strength to be here this morning. O oh, merciful God, we cannot just stop telling you of your great power and authority because you are the sovereign Lord. As we come into your holy presence, in this your sanctuary, Lord God, Father, we acknowledge that we have sinned against you. God, we know that we have not done the things we should have done because, God, we have walked away from your righteousness, from your holiness, and from your holy presence. Lord God, as we come, we confess to you, God, that we have left undone so many things that we should have done. And the things, Lord, that we should have done, we, the things that we should not do, Lord, those are the very things we find ourselves doing. And so, God, we confess that, God, we have sinned knowingly and unknowingly. And we ask, Almighty God, for your forgiveness. Father, we acknowledge that we have hated our brothers and sisters. Lord, we have been so selfish in our own ways that sometimes we too forget that you are the God who created us and has given us life. So we have not praised you and honored and glorified you as we ought to. Lord, we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. And so many times, Lord God, we carry on our lives as if there is no God. And we fall short, O oh God, of being credible witnesses of you. Forgive us, God, when we fear man and we seek to love the praises of man. And so we seek to do what man require, wants us to do instead of doing your good and perfect will. Lord, we acknowledge that we can be such double-minded people. We bless you with our lips, but with the same mouth, God, we curse others. God, have mercy. Have mercy upon us. Lord, forgive us for not doing what it is you require. Forgive us for being fornicators and adulterers. Forgive us, O oh God, for all the corruption that we have done in our lives and we know of that we, not, we do not speak about. Forgive us, Lord, when we have put other things and people and idols before you instead of worshiping you in spirit and in truth. So, Lord, we confess every wretchedness before you this morning and we lay them bare before you God 
Because your word reminds us, God, that nothing is hid from your eyes. And so we place them before you. And ask you, God, this morning to search us and know our hearts. Try us. Know every sinful thought, every wretched thought, every wicked thought. And God, I ask that you purge us individually and collectively with hyssop so we will be clean. Lord, wash us so we will be whiter, so much whiter than snow. We need your divine healing, your divine guidance, and your, direction, your guidance and direction so we can walk according to your perfect will. Merciful God, we thank you because you said that if we confess our sins, you, almighty God, you are faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we thank you for being merciful. We thank you, God, that your grace and your mercy is sufficient for us. And so as you have brought us together in this house of worship, Lord, we just ask you this morning to allow your Holy Spirit to saturate this place, to saturate this space. And may you touch us, God, one more time. Purge us and cleanse us and let us praise and honor you with all our heart. God, we pray that you'll bless our choirs. You'll bless the people in the sound room. God, remember our musicians. Lord, in a very special way, touch our pastor who will bring the word. We pray for strength. And we pray, God, that he will speak as you, have, as you give him utterance. Lord, we pray that you will just take total and complete control of each of us this morning and this worship service. As we give you all that we have, the honor, the glory, and the praise, and give you thanks through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. 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 We will now stand together for the responsive reading, which comes to us from Psalm 15. Let us stand. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voices are before the earth. Their words are in the words. In the heavens, God has reached a change for the sun. 
it is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. By them your servant is warned, in keeping them there is great reward. Keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then I will be blameless, innocent of great transgression. May the words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. The word of the Lord, we honor it by saying, Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. You may be seated. Let us now offer to God our gifts as well as ourselves in the service of God's kingdom. I'm going to ask the ushers to get ready to come to collect our tithes and offering for today. Our scripture comes to us from Malachi chapter 3 and verse 10. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. As our ushers come, one of them will lead us in prayer. Good day, brothers and sisters. Let us pray. Holy and righteous Father, we come before you today. We're asking that you humble our hearts to you, mighty God, as we return as gifts to you for those gifts that you have given unto us. We pray and ask you, Lord, to remove all fear and doubt where giving is concerned. Your word declares that by our sowing we shall reap. May it be into our hearts, Lord, to give unto you without doubting, without thinking that in doing so, mighty God, that we will never have enough, because your word declares that once it is that you, we are in your family, that you become our provider, you become our redeemer, you become the one who saves. Therefore, we have nothing to fear. Your perfect love will cast out all of these, and so, Lord, when we give, we give cheerfully. And we thank you for the opportunity to return unto you what you have given to us. In Jesus' holy and mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen.
Uh, there's a correction to one of our, the notices that was given earlier. The family Bible, our anniversary for Trinity Baptist Church will be next Sunday, March 10th at 3 p.m. and not this afternoon, as was earlier mentioned. And we want to offer condolences to our sisters, Doreen Facey and Daphne Hall, who lost two very close relatives last week. We're asking you to remember our sisters in prayer. Let us continue to offer praise in our worship to the Almighty God as we lift our voices to the Spirit of God. I'm going to ask the praise team to come. And brothers and sisters, we are going to stand. We are going to sing lustily. We're going to take off the roof and put it on back. But we are going to do it to the glory of God. Praise team. Praise the Lord. Good morning, my brothers and sisters. Our God is good all the time. Sister Sarah, it is such a pleasure to see you. Our God is good. Turn to your neighbor and say, God is good. We rise. Let's stand as we celebrate our ancient of days. We celebrate his excellent greatness this morning as his people. We celebrate his goodness. We celebrate his faithfulness. Bless the Lord. Let's put our hands together in praise.
place belongs to you, our friend, our redeemer, our keeper. You are always there for us, Lord. We declare that all glory and honor belong to you. Let the 
our worship to you, Lord, be like a sweet smelling perfume. Light of the world, you stepped down into darkness just so that we could have an eternal hope. So here we are to worship you, Lord. Accept our worship this morning. Hallelujah.
Praise the Lord. At this point, we're going to ask our deacon, Andrew Barnaby, to do the prayer of intercession. And when he's through, he's going to be praying for the little people who are going to the small people church. Good morning, church. Just before I pray, we're going to sing, He is here. And this morning, we're going to do it a little different. We want everybody to just remain seated. And you'll see why. Because this prayer, it's going to be a prayer of reflection and a prayer that we reflect upon the week that we have just gone through as a country. He's here. He's here. There is no doubt in our minds this morning that you are here. You are here with us in this country, in this church. You are here with us in this town. You are here with us in this parish. You are here with us in this country. And no matter where we go when we leave this country you are still here with us and we thank you lord that anywhere we go you are here with us lord we thank you for your awesome power we thank you for the watchful god that you are we thank you that no major thing or no minor detail is missed by you. You're majestic in all your doings, O oh God. And Lord, we pause this morning to just glorify your name. To lift you up, O oh God, as high as we possibly can, because you're worthy. You deserve all the praise, not mankind. You deserve all the glory. We thank you that you're the God that we call upon this morning. The God who means us well. The God who means every good thing to happen to our lives. We thank you and we praise you. But Lord, I pause to ask you to forgive me as I intercede on your people's behalf. Forgive me of my sins. Forgive each and every one of us in the hearing of my voice and on every platform. 
forgive each and everyone listening, oh God. Because Lord, it is nothing good that we have done to deserve you watching over every detail of our lives, but it's because of your grace and your mercy. Jesus, we thank you that you saw it fit to leave your heavenly throne and come down to show us the way, to leave an example for us to follow. And so in this season, oh Jesus, we just, we just pause to just lift up your holy name. And thank you that you bore the pain on the cross. That redemption came to mankind. Lord, we give you thanks. Especially for this week that has passed. As we pause in reflective mode, oh God. We think of the many things that could have gone wrong we think of the things that could have damaged so much more but because you watched over us oh god and because you care for this country jamaica land we love we give you the praise at the end of this week oh god for watching over us And Lord, we just pray, O oh God, that your hand will be on everyone who you put in authority. Your direction will be set in their minds and their hearts. And as we pick up the pieces, O oh God, I pray that you will direct your people in all that you would want us to do as a country to progress according to your will and your way. Lord, as we think of those bereaved who have lost loved ones, I pray, O oh God, that you will comfort their hearts, their souls, O oh God. Comfort, O oh God, and just Give them a sense of direction, Lord. Because, Lord, sometimes when you lose a loved one, we think life is at the end. But, oh God, I, I pray that you will provide direction. You will provide a sense of comfort in their lives. That you will be with them through thick and thin. Lord, in some of us lives and our families, oh God, the storms that are raging, I pray that you will calm those storms, oh Lord. I pray you will speak into every situation and speak peace, be still. Lord, there's so much demands that we look ahead and we are confused as to how the demands will be met. But, oh God, I pray that you will speak to these situations, oh God, that your provisions will come through. Your sustaining hand will sustain. Your comforting hand will comfort, oh God. I pray, oh God, that you will just cover us Guide us. Lead us, O oh God. Even when the feet feels like they can't go on. Put a little more energy in our feet, O oh God. And our hands, O oh Lord. And help us to do your will, O oh God. Because, Lord, it's most important when we think about your will. Because when all the dust settles, Lord, it's going to be about your will. Lord, some situations seem tough. 
and we are confused many times, oh God. But Lord, as I stand here this morning, I pray, Lord, that you will bring a sense of clarity to your people this morning. Your Holy Spirit, oh Lord, we ask that you will just use your Holy Spirit in our lives to show us all that you want us to do. Lord, I pray, Lord, for this church, this circuit. Lord, I pray that our pastor will get your direction day by day in how to lead. I pray that all the auxiliaries will get your direction with how to lead. I pray all the musicians, the ushers, the groundsmen, the people who clean, the people who keep things on track, I pray that you will give them your sense of direction. Help us to remove self from every situation in your work and to put you at the forefront. Lord, I pray, O oh God, that as we go day by day, that you will just lead Continue to lead. Continue to inspire us, O oh God. Because, Lord, your inspiration is always needed, O oh God. Those who are demotivated, I pray you will inspire them afresh, O oh God. For the young people, O oh God, in our nation, in our church, in our communities. I pray, O oh God that you will touch again. I pray that you will move everyone who is hidden in the wrong path towards you, O oh Lord. Help them not to be swayed by every thing that they hear, but to keep their focus on you, O oh Jesus. Because, Lord, when we keep our focus on you, we can only be pulled up by you to a higher plane. So I pray, O oh God, that every situation, those who are ailing, O oh God, pull up by their bedsides for those who are in the bed, O oh God. Whether they're in the hospitals or at home, pull up by their bedside this morning, O oh God, and give them that sense of touch of healing oh God healing and the revival in their souls oh God and Lord as we continue Lord I pray that you will touch the word that our pastor has from you touch it Lord let it not return void but to go and do all that you would want it to do I pray that every situation, every worship that we have before us, O oh God, that we'll do it towards you and you alone. Because you deserve all the honor, all the glory, and all the praise through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Young ones for Children's Church, could you come up in the aisle? Okay, little ones, close your eyes. Lord, we present these children before you this morning. We continually thank you for the children in our church. They are the future. Lord, I pray that you will touch their little hearts Touch their little minds. 
Touch every aspect of their little bodies, O oh God, from the crown of their head to the sole of their feet. Open up their hearts to your word. Those who will impart your words and the knowledge of your word to their little hearts, I pray that you will give them that special touch this morning. That everything that you want them to learn, they will learn this day. Because, Lord, it's the little bits and pieces that they're going to put together about you that's going to let them know more and more about you. So, Lord, I pray that you will touch their class or classes that they'll go to know and that you'll give them the joy of the knowledge of you and help them to enjoy you in its entirety in their class this morning. Through this, all this we ask, in your precious name we pray. Amen. You can lead off. Children, all the children of the world, every color, every race, all are covered by his grace. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Thank you, Deacon. We are now going to be having a selection from the youth choir as we continue in praise to our God, the youth choir. There's been many times that I've let you down, searching for happiness, but none to be found. To think that the price you paid for me wasn't in vain, oh, that I of the love that I found. Now I'm giving my best to you, Lord. All that I have, I won't withhold. Giving my best to you, Lord.
God Almighty, as we pursue integrity. So I'm going to call on our sister Shura Devi to come now and do the scripture reading, which comes to us from St. Matthew chapter 7, and she's going to be reading from verse 1 to 5. And I'm going to ask the church to stand. Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 to 5. Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the same measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eyes and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. The inspired word of the Lord, we honor it by saying, thanks, thanks be, be to, to God. God. You may be seated, my brothers and sisters. Our preacher appointed for today is our very own Reverend Kirk A. Pinnock. He will speak to us on the topic, the integrity of self-judgment. Let us, by faith, prepare our hearts to receive the truth of the word of God. Immediately after the ministry of the sanctuary choir, Reverend Pinnock will deliver the sermon. May the Lord add his blessings.
Praise the Lord, sisters and brothers. We thank our choirs for the timely reminders, the messages that we have a hope and a security when we ground ourselves in the God of our salvation. We can find peace and joy in times of true discomfort, particularly underneath the Lord's wings. I wish I could come and just jump into my sermon, seeing we only have a few moments left to preach. But circulating in one of our groups that is a group that captures the ministers of the Jamaica Baptist Union in St. Elizabeth, Manchester, and Clarendon. Our superintendent minister, the Reverend Carl Henning, shared with us that the Sydenham Baptist Church, which recently became a full-fledged church in the Jamaica Baptist Union, a part of the Gregory Park Circuit, where Reverend Henley serves as pastor, was cleaned out this morning by robbers. The chapel was broken into, and they really cleaned the place out. It is a sad note, but we take comfort in knowing that the same God who enabled the planting of that church in that community recently and enabled them to build a lovely sanctuary to enhance the beauty of that space recently. We're talking about a church who for the better part of a decade met in a classroom at Sydenham High and only recently managed to enter into their building after much sacrifice to equip that building with all the equipment needed for worship And the thieves made off with everything. Sisters and brothers, in times like these, we really need a savior. So let us pray for our sisters and brothers who came to church this morning to find the building devoid of all the implements they would have used to share in their worship experience. And if we think that we have problems, let us think for a moment of others. Let us pray. So, Lord, we first thank you for the many blessings we enjoy, for the ways that you have preserved and protected us. We too know what it is like to have your or sanctuary violated by thieves, who have made off with priceless and precious pieces of equipment and how we have labored to replace same. Lord, today, we stand in the gap for our sisters and brothers in St. Catherine, in the Gregory Park Circuit, and particularly the Sydney Baptist Church. Lord, may they not become weary, but find shelter and comfort under your wings this morning. May they find joy and peace at a time of complete and utter distress. Lord, may you meet and minister to both pastor and people and encourage their spirits even in and through this difficult time and season. Lord, we want to stand on the authority of your word that the enemy's plans against your church will not prevail that your church shall remain strong and will accomplish the purpose for which you appointed it here on earth, to go into the highways and byways and to preach this gospel, baptizing men and women in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And you promise, Lord, that you will never leave us nor forsake us. So we call upon you now in our time of need. Comfort. Strengthen, 
and empower us, Lord, to press on in the face of extreme opposition and discouragement. I pray this morning that you will rally your people to send support and comfort to your saints in St. Catherine, that you will rally your church to strengthen the saints in that part of the vineyard, that when called upon, Lord, we will play our part in helping them to restore that which was lost. Lord, we pray against the crime and the violence in this nation of ours, the decadence that causes us to feel unsafe in our homes, in our properties, at our businesses, and even at work. Lord, may you lift up a standard against a wave of injustice and evil that is destroying this great island nation, this paradise that you've blessed us upon which to be born, in which to live and to do business. Lord, as we minister in these parts, help us to be mindful of the magnitude of the work and to be equal to the task. Spirit of God, even now, as we seek to go forth into our own service, I pray that you, Lord, by divine grace, will minister to us and speak to us. Speak to us now, Lord, in and through your word. And cause a change to happen in our lives that only you can bring. Hear us now in the name of Christ our Lord. Who lives and reigns before you, with you, and within you, and the church. Now and forevermore. Amen. Sisters and brothers, this morning... I want to speak to us from the book of Matthew, as we've been doing since the beginning of this year. We have had the privilege of reflecting on the first six chapters so far, starting today and for the rest of this month. We will work through the seventh chapter, starting with the first five verses in today's service. Do not feel offended if I drag you through this sermon, because we have much to cover and little time in which to cover it. So, who won the local government election? Many people are still wondering. And if you get your news only from social media, you'll probably think your political party won. I'm not sure why this is a mystery. <laughs> but it has never been before. But I don't think we've ever had an election in our country when both sides claim victory. Well, that's good because it's a win-win for all. <laughs> I must say, though, that I'm feeling proud to be a Jamaican today. This may have been the most peaceful elections we've ever had. And we've seen instances where both parties got back to a bygone era where they could campaign together. When I say together, I don't mean in close proximity, I mean literally together, supporting the party of their choice without the vitriol and the violence that characterized our campaigns in the past. But the question still lies, who won? And the reality is that our Prime Minister, in a very humble and somber tone on the night of the elections, sought to outline why he believed his party won, outlining that they took seven of the seats of the parish councils to the opposition four. 
But those were based on the preliminary counts. Of course, there were at least two parish councils that were tied. And then there was the issue of the Portmore municipality, who for the first time was voting directly for their mayor. And this was new. Not the first time, sorry. Who generally votes directly for their mayor. However, maybe an hour before that, the leader of the opposition with jubilation had outlined that they had won four clear seats and that the two disputed parish councils were really not disputed because they believed in one division, the count would come in and they would get that victory. And even if it were a tie, they had won the popular vote in the era, which meant they would form, they would take the mayorship. And they also took the Portmore, and he outlined and that meant that based on their numbers, they had at least six with one pending. And they had also increased their number of seats of councillors from their last election in 2016. So he said by any metric or by that metric, the PMP won. You see, the judgment is out. And it depends on what parameters or what evidence you marshal. You will arrive at a conclusion as to who is the victor. Naturally, if you're a partisan, you will listen to your side and agree that you are the victor. Others will say, but the electoral office in its official record after the recount indicated, and this is what the fact says from the EOJ, that the JLP won seven seats and the PMP won five. So who should we believe? Whose account is correct? The reality is you'll have to really score through the information and then make a value judgment based on the evidence that is clearly there but not clearly reported to arrive at a conclusion which would be your judgment. So I'm sorry for all the sanctimonious church folk who will quote Matthew chapter 7 verse 1 and say, the Bible says, judge not. For this passage, judge not, is one of the second most known and quoted scriptures behind John 3.16. For even people who don't know one other verse in the Bible know that the Bible says, judge not. And unfortunately, saints of God, I must report that much like the uncertainty around the election results. There is great uncertainty around the usage or the common usage of this text. In fact, I could go out on a limb and say it has been the most misquoted and misused passage of scripture in all the Bible. It has been completely taken out of context misrepresented, misapplied, and misused. Many of us in this sanctuary have often used that same text conveniently to judge that. But when it suits us, oh, we are very judgmental. When we are on the wrong side of the judgment, we quote the text and say, don't judge me. The Bible says, Judge not. It's easy to quote it when you're wrong. But when you feel you're high and mighty, you forget about the text and go on into making judgments on other people's lives. But have you ever realized that when you pass judgment on someone and they respond, don't judge me, that they're also passing a judgment on you, it's like pointing the finger. 
Because every one you point forward, there are several pointing backwards at the same time. But as we seek to pursue our new biennial thematic foci, which is pursuing integrity, we are reminded that at our recently concluded 174th General Assembly at the National Arena, the Reverend Marvia Laws, who brought the morning message at the closing service, and the outgoing president, president the Reverend Dr. Glenroy Layla, who brought the closing message at the closing service, both challenged us to take up the charge to speak truth to power. That as the church of God, we must be ready and willing to make a value judgment on the world that we live in and to say whether or not it is aligned with the word and the will of God. I do not have time to outline the several passages in the scriptures that demands that we make a judgment. However, many of us, even if it came from Jesus' mouth, as it did, but particularly from Paul in the book of 1 Corinthians, right across the entire book. We have been skeptical to take any form of judgment at all. Some of us might even think it is righteous not to participate in politics. Take it from your pastor. You should go and vote, every one of you. It is a shocking disappointment and an historical law that only 29% of the electorate participated. If you never participated, you don't have a word or a right to criticize anything that happens in our country. But yet we make those judgments every day and fail to participate as an electorate. So, how many of us, be honest now, have quoted Matthew chapter 7 verse 1 and tell somebody, judge not? Don't raise your hands now. How many of us, when we've been guilty and under judgment, have told someone, don't judge me? Don't raise your hands now. But does the Bible really mean that we should not, under any circumstance, pass a judgment on a person, on a position, or on a particular situation? Well, saints, permit me in the next 15 minutes to challenge that notion and to show from our text today that we are encouraged not to refrain from judgment, but to make sure that if and when we do judge, we are to ensure that we first can see clearly before we make a judgment of others or we presume to help another. The text before us, Matthew chapter 7, verse 1, the closing chapter in Jesus' sermon on the mount challenges us to ensure that we can see clearly by reflecting on how we judge. The first two verses, it challenges us to recognize that judgment is permitted. The next two verses, three and four, it challenges us to reflect on the fact that self-judgment is primal. And in verse five, we cannot escape the reality that it affords by suggesting that hypocritical judgment is where the problem is. Hypocritical judgment is problematic. The text in question, Matthew 7, 1 through 5, is, a close, is the beginning of the closing segment of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. You would remember in the last month, that the previous two chapters, five and six, dealt first with the principles of true righteousness and the righteousness in our worship, all related to integrity. 
Now, Hoyles chapter 5 and 6 addressed what can be described as the inner man and his experience and encounter with God. This seventh chapter and the closing portion of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, this final segment, this conclusion to his inaugural message, deals not with the person or their insides, or, or the worship of the person in their relation to God. But it is dealing with our relation to the external world and with others. I love how Jesus built this one up. He starts with the individual and how they related to themselves and God. And then he moves to how the, relate, the individual relates together in worship. And now we've taken it outside of the church. We've gone into the community and how we relate to each other. The text, then sisters and brothers, challenges us first to accept the fact that judgment is permitted. Judgment is permitted. So when we're talk about, talking about the integrity of self-judgment, we must first accept that whether we like it or not, almost every second of the day, with every decision that we make or fail to make, we are making a judgment. Judgment is permitted as verse 1 and 2 of the text outlines for us. It says, do not judge or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. I am shocked that the church read those verses and the conclusion they come away with is that we must not judge. That is a cowardist, quietist, fearful, unbiblical interpretation and understanding that is unworthy of a person whose name is named by the name of Christ, who marched into that temple and whipped the money changers out of the holy place. How dare you call yourself a follower of Christ? And you read this text, and you cower under your covers into your shell to suggest that you know what? You better I keep my mouth shut for fear that if I open it, they may notice me. That is not what the text is suggesting. What it is suggesting, that judgment is bipolar in nature. And I don't mean schizophrenic at all. When it says, judge not, or you will be judged. It is suggesting to us that any one of us who is willing to stand in judgment of any other person must also themselves first be opened to be judged by others. There is no real judgment of another if there is no judgment of self. The text is suggesting that as we prepare to do what God calls us to do, to pass judgment on this world, we must first know that we will be judged as well. So the, the answer then to the puzzle and the dilemma we find ourselves in is not to disobey God and not judge so that we will not be judged. So that's what the text says. No, but that when we judge, expect to be judged as well. And that if we expect to be judged as well, we understand the bipolar nature of judgment. For the moment you look at me to describe who you think I am, you're also describing who you are as well. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And the measure with which you judge it will be returned and measured to you. So this bipolar judgment in nature is also proportional in measure. Judgment is proportional in measure. For there are some of us who expect 
to come down hard on somebody and then want an easy road. No, man, if you give it hard, you must expect it hard. If you, and that's why most of us want to give it soft. So we get it soft. And then think people are unfair when they come at us hard. The reality is, there is a proportional measure in judgment. And I've heard many Christians say, Rev, I have never hurt anyone. So why are people hurting me? Why me, Lord? You see, the proportional nature of judgment does not mean it's equal. For look at Jesus and realize that he had no sin of his own, did no wrong, yet he paid the price for all of humanity's sinfulness. Some of us must help to bear the cross. For judgment is permitted. It is inescapable. In fact, judgment is inevitable. It's inevitable and inevitable reality. There is none of us who can live in this world without facing judgment. You come to church, somebody look at how you dress. You may not hear it, but somebody noticed. And that's why when you looked in the mirror this morning, one of the thoughts that crossed your mind was a wonder if anybody have anything to say about how I look. And so, don't raise your hand. That's why you change that dress and put on something else. Don't look at your neighbor now. Look at me. Pay attention right here. The reality is, we keep on judging ourselves to ensure that when we step out, the judgment of others will be favorable. And so you realize that what the text is saying is that we cannot escape the concept of judgment. For whether we are judging ourselves, or we are thinking others are judging us, or we think God is judging us, judgment is inevitable. So this is a myth I want us to dispel from the beginning. That judgment or the lack of judgment or the refraining from judgment is not what the text is suggesting when it says do not judge or you will be judged. It is asking you to juxtapose your judgment with the reality of the others. That as you judge yourself and judge others, you also must be open to be judged as well. And so judgment is permitted. Let's affirm that, that judgment is permitted. So if judgment is permitted, what kind of judgment are we who are called by the name of Christ permitted to do? Permit me then to subject or submit to you that if judgment is permitted, we must take careful note to exercise right judgment. I'm presenting to you this concept called right judgment or righteous judgment, an integrity-based judgment, a judgment that is not simply grounded in an accountability, which is the step cousin of integrity. So after the fact, you stand the consequences of your action, but true integrity that says you will not engage in such an action to or in order to start withstand its consequences. A righteous judgment and integrity-based judgment is first self-acknowledging. The text in verse 3 of Matthew 7 makes this point clear. It suggests to us that why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eyes and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? I don't need to preach that sermon. For we have all been guilty of that. A kind of self-righteous judgment, not grounded in integrity, but a judgment that is not acknowledging of one's own faults, one's own weaknesses, or one's own sins. 
Yes. We engage in a judgment that is devoid of any conscience at all. That's why the text tells us that when we speak of the integrity of self-judgment, we have to see self-judgment as primal. In other words, we can't begin or engage in the judgment of anyone else without first subjecting ourselves to personal judgment. This right judgment, which is, which is self-judgment first, is acknowledging that all have sinned and come short of God's glory. When you presume to stand in judgment of anyone or anything or even yourself, acknowledge first what the scripture tells us, that all of us are short before God. And if we are all short before God, before we start to pass it on to others, we have to pass it over ourselves. Before we turn the searchlight out, we have to turn it in. We have to be able to examine our own strengths, our own weaknesses, our own frailties, and our own faults. Some of us think that we are 100% perfect. And it's unfortunate because this is not a self-effacing kind of activity. Self-judgment is not to, to deface your own character or to debase oneself. Self-judgment does not require you to put yourself down lower than you are. Self-judgment just requires you to be honest and open and acknowledge where you are. Understand why this is necessary. If God calls us to exercise righteous judgment, we can't be righteous if there is an impediment in us. We can't be right before God if there is something hindering us. We can't be right with our brother or our sister if we are not able to see clearly. So when we are judging, let us first judge ourselves. Let us deal with our own prejudices, our own faults our own weaknesses, our own pet peeves. You know, one of the things that I've always wrestled with now that I'm a parent, I remember as a child growing up, invariably as a child, you're going to destroy some of your parents' property. And the easiest one to destroy is the crockery. Yes. How many plates have you broken as a child? Oh, I've done my fair share of cups and glasses and all sorts of things. And my mother always warned me, you're going to pay for everyone. You're going to pay for everyone. I wonder as a parent, when your child destroys a plate or a glass and you get angry at them and you scold them and of course give them the Jamaican warning, you're going to pay for everyone. Do you scold yourself when you do it? What actions do you take against yourself? How do you judge yourself when you find that you are guilty of the thing that you judge your own child for? Who puts you in a corner? Who gives you time out? Who cuts your allowance? Do you cut your own allowance? How are we in that regard? Because the truth is, you know, my mother broke some dishes too. And I wonder who scolded her. Oh, because it's her that she's allowed to break it? I don't know. The judgment seemed off a bit. She bought it so she can break it. The judgment doesn't seem righteous at all. It is not right. So, so hear what I'm saying and you get the idea. That when we're talking about righteous judgment, this is a, a self-judgment which is primal. It must be the first order. Before we begin to take any act of judgment, the judgment must start with oneself. And you acknowledge where you are on this scale. 
You see, for if you do not acknowledge where you are on the scale, you may not be able to meet out the right measure of judgment to others. You see, the truth is some of us have no right to speak to others or to speak about others. We've not earned the authority to stand in judgment over another because we've not done the introspective work necessary to give us a proper understanding of where we are before God. So right judgment is self-acknowledging. But this self-judgment that is primal, which leads to right judgment, is also other protecting. Hear why you need to judge yourself first. You see, when you judge yourself, you realize that I have been guilty of the same thing. When as a parent you judge yourself and you realize that I made these mistakes when I was a child. When you see your own child now making the same mistakes you've made you come at it a little differently because you remember how you struggled. You remember the pains you went through to learn those lessons. And so when your child expects to be scolded in the worst way, they are met with love. The text says Jesus came and he experienced all the temptations we did without sin. And so he is not a high priest who is not attentive are aware of the pains and sufferings we faced. And so that is why he's able to measure his intercession on our behalf. So I challenge you, when we have a good self-judgment, self-acknowledging game, we're actually able to protect others when we judge them. Because if you're the kind of person who has never done proper self-reflection, who have never acknowledged your own weaknesses and faults, you will be so super righteous that your words will burn deeply into others without remorse. And you'll destroy more than you build. Right judgment must be other protecting. Because it tempers us from going scorched earth on another person, acknowledging that we too struggle from the same infirmities. Yes, self-judgment is primal. This right judgment that is self-acknowledging and other protecting is also other promoting. For the text continues in verse 4. How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all that time you still have a plank in your eye. You see, you are presuming that you can help another when you need help yourself. You are presuming that you stand at a place where you can lift others up when you need lifting yourself. You are acknowledging that, that you are somehow spiritually filled when in truth, you are drier than the person you are trying to help. You cannot help them to reach another level if your level is beneath them. Come on, somebody. The text is suggesting that if indeed you really, really wanted to help another, if you want to elevate them or to promote them, that you may be better served dealing with yourself first before you're able to truly advance them from where they are. You know, on the airplane, they tell you, put on your oxygen mask first. In the event of an emergency, when that mask drops down, put your mask on first. Then, Seek to help another put theirs on. That is a challenge that most of us don't get. We do not spend enough time in self-reflecting, in self-analyzing, in self-acknowledging, in other protecting before we start to promote or to lift up or to try and help another. You see, truly, if you're trying to help me but you can't see clearly, you're helping me down. 
you are leading me astray. You are presuming that you can carry me from where I am to where I need to be. But where are you? You are lost yourself. The text says, clean up your eyes first. Spend some more time in self-judgment. And when you are critical in self-judgment, you'll be better able to judge or to help others. Let's bring this home. If self-judgment is primal and it's self-acknowledging, other protecting and other promoting, then we must take care then that we are not hypocritical in our judgment. And this is expressed clearly in verse 5 of the text. Here, the author, Matthew, challenges his readers, his hearers, as Jesus now, speaking to his disciples on the mount. He's speaking to thousands of persons who have gathered in an amphitheater-like setting to hear his inaugural message. Remember, they had come from the Decapolis, the ten city state. They had come from the regions of Galilee, all over north, southern Syria and northern Israel. They had come to hear him. He had a large audience who were listening to his message. A people who wanted liberation from the Roman authorities. A mixed multitude that included scribes and Pharisees and the religious elite. And Jesus looked at the crowds, including his recently as last week hand-picked disciples. And he said to them, as I say to you this morning, you hypocrite. As I say to myself, you hypocrite. As, she, as we should say to each other, you hypocrite. You realize this only Jesus could say it and truly mean it. Jesus said, you hypocrite. First, take the plank out of your own eye. And after you've done the self-work, then you will see clearly to remove this speck from your brother's eye. I love how the text did not require us to compare whose sin was larger or whose eye impediment was greater. For as most of us, you know, would want to be the one with the speck. But you realize that the speck was also disqualifying before God. Some of us are comfortable with a speck. In fact, many of us have been nurturing our speck for decades. Many of us read this text and think that God is comfortable with this speck. And so because we only have a speck, we continue with our speck and think that God is pleased with that speck. Dear the loving Christ say that there is a thing about the man with the speck that is problematic. Natural reasoning would say to us that it is the one with the speck who is closer to clearer vision. And so the one whom Jesus should be directing his attention was the man with the speck to say, since as you are almost seen, you now must clear the speck first. Then you are going now to help the brother with the log because he's blind. The truth is, Jesus flipped the script. Jesus was actually suggesting that the man that was half blind was at a better position to correct the situation of blindness amongst the crowd than the one that only had the speck. You see, the one that had the speck recognized that he wasn't seeing clearly but felt good about himself because he was more righteous. He never had the same challenges as the one with the log. Oh, many of us walk around with our speck and thinking that somehow we are closer to God than the ones with the logs in their eyes. Imagine having a log in your eyes. Everybody can see it. But we can hide this speck and pretend to be righteous. Jesus exposed the hypocrisy 
hypocrisy of those who were before him. For they were quick to live as righteous, not recognizing that God saw this speck. And that the speck made them pompous. And that even the blind man with the log also saw the speck. But because he was totally blind, he couldn't see his own faults. It's amazing how God looked at the man in a worse condition and said, you need to go help your brother who is better off than you. But be careful. Don't presume that you can aid his condition in the condition that you are. So whether you have the log or the speck, God is speaking to you. Clean up your eyesight. Address your own malady. And then come and help me to help others to see. I wonder if there's someone here today who is willing to acknowledge their frailties and their faults before God. I wonder if there's someone here today who is willing to say, Lord, I don't want to be hypocritical anymore. You see, hypocritical judgment is self-deceiving. It causes you to feel that you are all right. But you're very wrong in the eyes of God. Both the man with the speck and the log were hypocrites. Sinners in God's eyes and needed to see. The, the moniker to judge not is not indicative of not passing judgment at all. But it's to ensure that when you have to judge, you are ready and right before God to judge. Because if we don't do it, the church would be blindly going to hell in a handbasket. Your sister must be able to point out a fault within you. Your brother must be able to say, you are not right. Your pastor must be able to rebuke you. And your pastor must be able to take corrections as well. All of us have some malady. Whether a speck or a plank, it must go. Jesus' intention was so that all could see. His intention was not to run away from the responsibility of judgment for fear that your weaknesses might be exposed. It's not a call to quietism and silence when you see wrong happening in the church among the people of God. Someone must speak out. But can you imagine the sin happening among us and the whole are we silent? Why? Because we nurture in our speck. We are harms and gloves up our sin. And we are afraid if we speak out against any sin in others, ours might be exposed. Hear what Jesus says. Why you not start dealing with your sin? Why is it that we don't all address whether the speck or the plank in our eyes so that we can see a little clearer? To help a brother and a sister. It is Jesus' intention that all should be healed. But if this church continues to be hypocritical in its judgment, it's not only self-deceiving, but it is community depleting. Let me say it again. When we fail to address the issues of right judgment, or when we persist in hypocritical judgment to see it and turn a blind eye, our communities will be destroyed. Our faith community first will go, and then the rest of society will languish in decadence. Do you not know that your vote for or against a political candidate is an indication of your confidence or distrust in that candidate. When as a collective nation, 71% of us fail to participate in the electoral process, we reduce our society to be led 
by the vocal minority who do not all possess the requisite experience, understanding, or knowledge to guide our country. When we refrain from exercising rights that three Baptist deacons who are national heroes fought for and attained for us what we do as a nation is undermine God's will and purpose for our lives. One thing we believe as Baptists is that God don't always speak through the crowd. Yes, but he does speak through the people. And I challenge us that when we fail to do it at church, because it's the same, 29% come out for church elections too, you know. We fail to do it at church. We fail to do it at the local government. We fail to do it at the general elections. We are failing our divine mandate. We allow corruption to continue. We allow evil to persist. If you believe the government is doing well, vote to keep them in power. If you see fault, vote to remove them from power. But if the rest of us leave it to the tribal few, nothing will change. And that is a definition of hypocritical judgment. The text challenges the church. To not be self-deceiving or community depleting. But worse, when hypocritical judgment characterizes the way we operate as children of God, it is mission destroying. Jesus, at the beginning of his earthly ministry, wanted all his followers to understand that my plan is for the redemption of all humanity. My plan is for that every person with an eyesight defect to be able to see clearly. So whether you like it or not, you cannot escape making judgments. For if you start with self-judgment, you will see clearer to help your brother who is not seen. So here is how I conclude. One. Never be afraid to pass judgment that is in accord with righteousness. The righteousness that is grounded in Almighty God. The church is expected to be those in our society who pass right, righteous judgment. Two, never be so assured of yourself that your judgment is clouded by self-righteousness and becomes hypocritical judgment. That you don't even see where you are weak and make the necessary adjustments. And so from a hypocritical standpoint, you pass judgment on others. That is not of God. And finally, God calls us to make daily spiritual value judgments, first of ourselves, then of our situations, of our surroundings, our society, and our spiritual community, so that we may all see a little more clearly. So if somebody tell you, say you're wrong, don't get upset. Hold it, imbibe it, so that you can see a little clearer. Yes, when I get my leaks, I take them. When I get my criticisms, I, I respond to them. And if it look like I'm not learning, I promise you I'm trying. But we must all be able to take it so that we can all see more clearly what God's will is for us. Amen. Oh, hymn of response. Have thine own way, Lord. Thou art the potter. Mold me and make me 
after thy will. While I am waiting, yielded and still. I'm going to invite us to sit and sing this hymn of response. And I'm only going to invite you to stand if you're willing to make an altar where you sit or where you stand. If the Lord has spoken to your heart today and touched you, say, Lord, I've examined myself and I see my faults. I want to see a little more clearly. And I want to help others see a little more clearly. So change me, Lord. I'm open to be changed by you. So that you can use me to change others. So please remain seated. As we sing this hymn of response. And if you feel a strong conviction to move, make the altar where you stand. Or do what, do what old Baptists do if you can and kneel and make a fresh commitment to God. a little slower. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Search me and try me, Master, today. Whiter than snow, me was now as in thy presence humbly I bow have thine own way Lord have thine own way wounded and we I pray, power, all power, surely is mine. Touch me and heal me, Savior divine. Have thine own way. Let us pray. Lord, help us to acknowledge where we are with you. To acknowledge how far we are from you. To acknowledge that there is ground to cover. To acknowledge that you invite us to come closer to draw nearer. Lord, as we shed the things that obscure our vision, 
And as by your divine grace, we are enabled to see much clearer. May the life we live clarify the vision of others so that they will see Christ always living in us. That Lord, where they cannot see or hear or feel you, they will see us. They will hear us. They will feel our presence near them. So that when we point out the sins present in their lives, they will be moved, motivated, and enabled to yearn for a closer walk with you. Lord, help us never to be weary. Even as we prepare to go into a season of evangelistic outreach. Lord, we present ourselves as a church before you. Full of sin. Full of shame. But ready, Lord, to be used by you. To go where you send and to do what you say. So Lord, lead us. Lead us according to your will. Walk with us. So that we will walk always with you. Live in us. That we may live in you. So that when we proclaim your word. Truly. Others will be blessed. Hear us now Lord. Minister to us now, Lord. And as we submit to you, use us for your glory. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. As we prepare to receive the gifts prepared by God for the people of God, I invite us to sing the refrain, Search me, O God. And to know my heart today as we prepare our hearts to receive the Holy Sacrament. The Lord Jesus invites us to draw near to the sacred table, not because we must, but because we may. We come not to testify that we are righteous, but that we sincerely love the Lord and it is our desire to be his true disciples. We come not because we are strong, but indeed because we are weak, not because we have any claim on heaven's rewards, but that in our frailty, and in our sin, we acknowledge our need for heaven's mercy and help. So as we come, I want us to continue the self-reflecting, the self-evaluating, so that we can acknowledge and confess that had it not been for the Lord on our side, where would we be? Where would our church be? Where would our families be? 
Where would our homes, our businesses, where would our lives be? We leave this sanctuary pretty much like this. There are no grills, no bars. And so it is across this circuit. And one may describe the locations of our sister churches as rural inner city areas. There are no homes nearby this particular church where your neighbor can give an eye for you. We're vulnerable. And we depend only on the divine grace of God. Today, as we receive this gift, reflective of this grace, I want us to affirm and reaffirm our faith in a God who is sure and who will come through for his people and for his church. My sisters and my brothers, let us look to God in prayer. And as we pray, pray for yourselves, pray for this sanctuary, pray for the work of God among us. Lord, we are not worthy even to gather the crumbs from under your table. But you, Lord, invite us to come, to draw near, to receive this sacrament to our comfort and our growth in grace. Lord, we acknowledge that we have come short of your glory. But we also acknowledge the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross that purchased a salvation that gave us the right to be adopted into your family and to be called the sons and daughters of God. So Lord, we stand on that divine authority declared to us in your word that we are not ordinary but extraordinary people called into your divine service. Lord, as we enlist in your mighty army, general, go before us and do thy work thyself. Then lead us in your wake to finish that which you've set before us without fear or favor. Lord, as we come boldly, not in any strength of our own, but in that strength imputed by Christ, we come thankfully acknowledging that you continue to preserve us, this church, our sister congregations and the people of this church, this sanctuary. Lord, even now, as we come before your mercy seat, before this sacred table to receive your gifts, we reaffirm our oneness with you and our commitment to pursue integrity. Lord, as we evaluate ourselves today, give us the encouragement to press on. The validation to be confident. Lord, remove the doubt and the fear that the enemy is even trying to sow right now. And let us receive this gift to our comfort and our growth in grace. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. The Apostle Paul tells us about the institution of the Lord's Supper in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. He said the Lord Jesus on the night that he was betrayed he took bread and after the prayer of thanksgiving he broke it and said this is my body which is broken for you. Eat it in my memory. In like manner after supper he took the cup of salvation and said this cup is a new covenant in my blood. As often as you drink from it, you show forth my death until I come. In eating and drinking, we memorialize Christ's sacrifice on the cross and we reinterpret it for our times today. We take hold of the affirmation it gives 
that we are not our own. Truly, we belong to Jesus. We have been bought back, redeemed from death. So the life we now live is to be lived in and through Christ. Living in and through Christ begins first with this acknowledgement that we are insufficient for self-sustenance. That we need a savior to guide us, to direct our path. And so all of us who have looked away from our accomplishments, from our achievements, and we look to the cross, you're invited to receive this to your growth in grace. If you are here, and you've not made that firm commitment. I ask that you allow the plate, the wafer, and the wine to pass you by. And as they pass you by, see it as the grace of God also passing you by. And resolve in your heart that the next time we meet in this fashion, that you too would have made a personal commitment to surrender your lives to Christ. So that you too may receive his gift. As we distribute the emblems, I remind us all to receive them humbly, to receive them graciously. But in receiving them, remember to receive it confidently. But Jesus already paid the price. And so we now can enjoy the gifts. As Jesus sent his disciples to feed his sheep, so I send you deacons of this church on the shepherds of the flock to serve the people of God with the body of Christ broken and the blood of Christ shed. During the distribution of the emblems, we will sing the hymns as printed on the program, Blessed Redeemer. Sisters and brothers, if you are able to at this stage, please sit in alternate benches so the deacons are able to serve you a little easier. Thank you. Ushers, please assist in having the person sit in alternate benches.
here at your table, Lord. I come with joy to meet my Lord.
the wafer represents for us the body of Christ, broken for us. Let us eat it with thanksgiving. The cup represents for us the blood of Christ shed for us. Drink it for your comfort and growth in grace. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for feeding us with the body and the blood of your dear Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It has caused us to reflect on how frail and weak we are. Yet when we stand in the name of Jesus, we become powerful and nothing can stand against us. And so Lord, send us forth into this dark world with this powerful light. To light up every corner that you send us. To be a beacon of hope for change, for justice, for truth, for integrity in this country called Jamaica. Lord, help us as a church to play our part in advancing the welfare of our communities, this country, and the whole human race. Help us, Lord, to rebuild our nation in your image, to be active and proactive, to ensure that our country reflects your glory. Lord, help us to remove some of the stigmas that have reflected our lives as a country and cause us now, Lord, to re-image and represent your image in this world as one that is right and true. As we depart from the sanctuary one from another, watch over us, Lord. Watch between us, Lord. We pray for the activities that are coming up this afternoon for the Sunday school anniversary at New Green the one next week in Porus and Greenvale and the one on the third week of this month here at Mandeville may we support our sister churches and support our own activities Lord we pray for the continued Lenten services this month and particularly for the service that will be held here this Wednesday afternoon. Lord, may we come out to enjoy fellowship with each other and with you. We pray that you speak to the one who will deliver the word. That, Lord, it will be inspiring, refreshing, and challenging. Lord, remember those among us who are unwell. Remember Deacon Brown in particular and ask, Lord, that you continue to nurture her back to full strength. Lord, remember those who celebrate birthdays in this month and all the families that are earmarked for special prayers this week. Lord, have mercy upon us as a congregation. We pray especially for our children, particularly those who are preparing for end of semester examinations, especially those at the tertiary level. Remember our brother Shamoy Royce in China. As he begins a new semester, we pray, Lord, that you will continue to walk with him, continue to nurture him, continue to guide and provide for him. We ask, Lord, as you did for the children, wandering band of Arameans, you will set provision before him for your glory. Lord, for those who are studying here, we pray that you'll open doors of opportunity for them as well. Lord, those who need scholarships, grant it unto them. For others, Lord, who need just a word of encouragement, may they receive it from us. May we as a congregation be that type who is not afraid of judgment ourselves, but are open to offering help to others, even if that makes us vulnerable. Hear our prayers now, Lord, as we prepare to depart from this sanctuary. 
Bless us now in the name of Christ our Lord who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forevermore. Amen. And amen. While the cups and the benevolent funds are being collected, permit me to share a brief bit of information with you. I'm going to ask the sound room, Sister Grace, if you're able to, to put up a picture of young brother Shamoy Royce. I want to make a special appeal to the church on behalf of our brother. Some of you do not know Shamoy. So I'm not sure if I'm getting the support from the sound room. But Brother Shamoy, as you should know, is studying medicine in China. It is freezing cold in China right now. It is frigid. And he begins a new semester. And he needs our support. He has been in contact with our church and with our youth department. And I can confirm, and we want to thank God, that not only did he pass again all of the subjects he did last semester, but he passed all of them with flying colors. Yes. He says it's pretty competitive. He, there are three places in each year that can attain a scholarship and you must maintain a 90 odd percent average he missed out on the scholarship by point one. Point one. so because he missed out he needs our continued support for his tuition his boarding his food and so on i won't give you the details of the amount but in China, when you live in a little room on campus, you have to pay for your, your light, your water, and your internet. And if you fail to pay, they can turn off your room by itself. So he needs to make sure that each month he's able to cover his living expenses in a foreign country where he is a Jamaican. And so I'm asking the church for a special offering next week. Or if you're not going to be here, you can leave same at the church office. But make a special note as to who it's for on the envelope. And so we'll have a special walk-up offering next week for this, to this effect. I wanted to be able to put his picture up so you can see him smiling with a few of his medical colleagues over there trying to take a rough life easy. But um, the picture is not up. What we will do, we'll send it to the church's WhatsApp group. And I ask that you remember him in prayer so that he will be able to successfully complete his course of study. Thank you very much. Sisters, brothers, for hearing and participating. I know I can count on you to support one of our young brothers. As we do that, as we do that, I want you to do something else for me. Today, we witnessed something spectacular. Well, at least in my judgment. Two of the shyest young people in the church led the youth choir today. I am shocked. I am flabbergasted and amazed. Two of the shyest youth on the choir. And they did exceptionally well. 
and I thank God for them. I won't put them through any further embarrassment by calling on them to stand or anything like that. But I, I know particularly their mothers must be beaming with joy right now because we know how far these little ones have been coming from and what a joy it is to see them. And I'm saying this to say this, that each year, you know, the youth choir is a transient choir. In a few months, we're going to lose at least two or three of them again. And you see those two sitting at the back there? They are the ones going off to university. And I think one other, Dante as well, right. And so the choir will look very different come September. So I make the appeal again. Please, if you have a youth, send them out. The ministry of the choir is the best way to get a young person out of their shell and growing. They can't keep singing these wonderful biblical truths and not be nurtured spiritually by it. Many of us grew from serving in the church's youth choir. So if you're a young person down there, we want to see you up here. Choir rehearsals are Friday afternoons at 4.30. Please parents, make provision so that they can come out. I make the same appeal. For the sanctuary choir as well. Because we have more empty spaces up here. And especially men. We want some bass voices. So if you have it, use it. For God's glory. And join the choir. Will you stand with me? As we prepare to share in our hymn of departure and benediction. Let others see Jesus in you. Please sign the communion register before you leave. It's at the door. You can sign during the singing as well. While passing through this world of sin and of the lives of you, be clean and pure without women, and all the sea Jesus in you. Let
receive the blessing and now may grace, mercy, and peace from our God of integrity who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit rest, remain, and abide with us and all of God's people everywhere and especially the saints in Sydney Baptist Church now and forevermore. Amen and amen. Please greet someone before you go. There is Brother Shamoy on the left. Please remember to sign the register before you go. God bless you.